So I'd like to give a, it's only my name up here, but I just like to sh give a shout out to Matt Fisher, who sits next to me at Teradata for probably 10 years and he gets tortured with me talking back and forth about ideas. So he helped me a lot with some of this stuff here. So what we're going to talk about today is I want to talk a little bit about a, a targeted market review. And this is not what you think. It's not the market. It's basically saying, what do I worry about? So when I start to talk about viewpoints and things is the space that I'm worried about. So it's not a marketing slide. You've never seen me do a marketing slide. Um, I'll do some basic background. I'm not sure your backgrounds. And I'm only just going to do just a touch of background data just so we, I, I can make my points. And then you can throw uh, tomatoes at me if you don't agree. Um, I'm going to talk about some trends. And one of the most important things here is there's a couple of trends that are sneaking up on us. And it's got me a little bit worried in terms of doing large system design. Um, where we, I'm going to do, talk about where we are today. Um, there's going to be a lots and lots of measured data. And in fact, just about everything you'll see will be results of measured data, some of which I had to be a little careful of, too, because of NDA issues. But uh, we'll get through that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about something that's coming uh, at the end of this year, which is NVMe uh, 1.4, which is really important for the storage area. There's some cool features in here, which have a lot that I'm very interested in. Specifically, we're going to talk about the, the NVMe sets and the endurance groups. And we'll talk about how that, why I care about that. And of course, then the question is still being putting a leg of research hat on there is that we're going to take a summary is, can we do tiered storage using NVMe groups and uh, sets and endurance groups? And there's to solve a specific problem in terms of the technology going on. And that's going to be the open question. I'm doing some modeling on that, but I don't have any hardware really to show results on that. So there's all kinds of dimensions for what, you know, how you can look at, how you can look at a system size. And there's, you know, scalability and performance and availability. The, what I'm going to be worried and when you get to big systems, I'm really worried about degraded performance, stranded performance, and making sure you get performance and capacity density. I mean, because you really need to be able to, sometimes you say, I'm going to buy a system that's, you know, five petabytes in size or 10 petabytes in size, and it just doesn't fit. And you have to worry about physical constraints. You want performance densities for that because you only have a certain number of floor tiles. And the worst thing you want to do is don't want to have stranded resources because, again, you have a stranded resources on systems of any size, just a significant amount of money. Um, so the goal is going to be, so when you think about why I'm talking about things, think about I'm trying to minimize stranded resources. They get really expensive at scale. I'm going to focus only this talk. There's a whole stack you have to worry about. I'm just going to focus today on large capacity SSDs because that's where I think there's some disconnect coming along. Um, Big systems in terms of a Teradata system, you know, five cabinets, but this is where you start to get into some of the money issues to worry about the cost of the stuff. I'm going to touch on a bunch of optimization things, rack density, strained performance, and then minimizing degraded performance. When you get to big systems, something's always broken. And it's really nice to design a system that all works when everything works, but when the system, when something breaks and the performance tanks, that's not good because you get a big system with, you know, nowadays maybe 10,000 drives. In the past, we saw 30,000 hard drives in a system. It was incredibly difficult to keep something like that running at peak performance. So let's talk about cost. And I obviously have to take cost numbers off. But if you have different configurations in this space, you end up with, uh, with a distribution that looks like this. And I took a bunch of stuff on the open market and just looked at how they were configured and priced and cost them out not price. And if you can take a look at this, regardless of whether you're using a CPU-heavy environment or you can look at it another way, you're not efficiently running code where you're wasting CPU cycles because you don't have the match between computational and storage, right? You end up with these kinds of pie charts. And if you're incredibly efficient, in other words, you're squeaking every resource out and you are driving significantly high IOPS and bandwidths out of devices, you kind of go to the right side. So if you look at the pie chart, regardless of where you go, you see storage is both a large cost part and it's also part of the, the capacity. Now, let's talk about a little bit of, I'm going to talk about SSD devices and over-provisioning. So an SSD device consists of all these flash chips in here. They're laid out. And this is no single vendor's architecture. But basically, you have a layer that translates blocks to, to memory locations in the back end. 
and you have a lot of them are pipelines. Sometimes they'll have multiple, more than one processor here, and they divvy the, the parts up so you can get parallel operations, and the blocks on this side are mapped to memory on this side. Now, this interface is a, is a standard. It's a PCI. It could be a Gen, 4, a Gen 3 by 4 by, or by 8, depending if it's a plug-in card, but it's a standard, so all the vendors compete to get the best performance out of the standard interface. So one of the things you're going to hear me keep saying is there's going to be a certain amount of resource performance stranded behind this interface. In other words, the back end, and I'll give you some evidence of that, is actually quite capable of more performance. But the interface, because it has to be interoperability, will be a bottleneck. And one of the things is, is how we can change that to get better utilization of that. So you've got this mapping. Now, Flash, you heard about wear out and stuff like that. You don't write in place. So the work around the fact that you don't, you can't write in place is they do over provisioning. So in other words, there's always free buffers that are always erased and you have this concept of varying the amount of extra free buffers. And in many conditions, the amount of free buffers space is the indication of how much you can, fast you can write. So there was more free buffers. So if you look at this case, you can vary the over provisioning. You've got some inherent overhead. The, the vendors often give you a capacity point where you can't go below. You can then, through commands, move this over provisioning, and you, then you lay your file system out. Typically, you don't do this on the fly. You do this before you set up the, your, your, de your device, and then you work it this way. But you can change the amount of over provisioning which varies the amount of capacity. The cost of the device is based really on the amount of, of flash devices and the dollar per gigabyte that you're actually paying is really based on the advertised capacity. So if you push the over provisioning up, the dollar per gigabyte gets better, but as you push it up, the right performance gets worse. Now there's more than just the amount of free buffers that, inter that, that cause the right performance to vary. But just keep that in mind. You can vary the dollar per gigabyte by varying the OP, and you can also vary the performance by varying the over provisioning. And it's a thing you can change, right? So it, there's, there's trim commands and other variations of this thing, but let's just talk about that. Now, so here's a chart. I apologize. I had to normalize it because there's just too much I just didn't want to get into too much NDA data. The way it was normalized is normalized within each group. So it normalized to the lowest right out of the IOPS area. Here's the lowest amount of IOPS that's normalized in this group. Same one sequential read. And capacitor course are just normalized in single columns. And of course, the, the rows, I've got our good old friends, the old 7.2K, 7, 7 3, 3 and a half inch hard drives, which hopefully are going away soon. I keep saying that. Then I mapped out NVMe in the past, current, and future. So if you look down the line, you go, okay, current 12, you know, you look at a 12 terabyte drives and you look over future, ah, in, this, in a two and a half inch form factor, we see a pretty good move up in an enterprise based drive that's, that in this case, I'm talking about something in the one drive right per day, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that is. You go in good capacity increase. Dollar per capacity, well, it's pretty expensive to start. It's improving. IOPS are getting better. Both the read IOPS, the write IOPS, the sequence of read is getting better. And now you also have to look here from this current to the future. We're getting a, the NVMe goes from Gen 3 to Gen 4. So you're getting a double doubling in the bandwidth in the device. So this is actually pretty impressive that, you know, you get, you actually getting a your significant improvement in a short technology jump. But you can also then start to see, you know, see some issues here. You see the write ops are going up, but the read ops definitely went up quite a bit. And there's really often not a huge technology change in the back end here. So this is an indication right at this point that there's an awful lot more read performance sitting behind this device than the performance they actually can get to the bus. Now, if you look at the ratio of IOPS from to reads to writes on this model, you go, uh-oh, now we got a little bit of a problem. Here's what's creeping up on us. We start with a hard drive, and remember, many databases started long ago, and they were designed with the fact that hard drives, reads and writes are about the same, and you're looking at that. As you read going forward, we're seeing, especially on the capacity side, this, this creep up. And this is pretty important. 
this is a pretty significant jump. That means that you can read it, and we'll talk about, we'll normalize this to capacity in a minute. You can read the device, but it's getting harder and harder to write. Now, if you flip and look at these same metrics when you normalize them against capacity, so you divide that by capacity, you can start to see some other little interesting trends here. Look at this. You can see the read IOPS have actually, this is a pretty good jump for one generation. Again, more indication there was plenty of read performance because I doubled my capacity. I went from 15 terabytes device to 30, and I still got an increase in read performance per, per capacity, but look what happened to writes. Writes went down, and you know, of course, the same read to write ratios. You can see sequential reads and writes are also decreasing as well, all right? So sequential mode, there's some op op opportunities for performance in the NVMe that, uh, and SSDs, but let's not, I'm not gonna worry too much about that, but you can see there's some numbers, and if you start to look at it, if you're looking at sequential mode, it's starting to get down closer on a per capacity basis. So things to take away from this is you got to be careful about you can reading and writing. It's getting really hard to write these devices, and your and the and the capacity is growing quicker. So you're actually getting, except in this case here, which is actually pretty good, you're getting a reduction of how many times you can actually look at the device. Now. This, this is a hierarchy, we've seen this before, and this is a very common hierarchy We you look at, you're going from CPU core to memory, to, to in this case is PCI Gen 4, I'm doing a looking forward, so I'm going to have to wave my hands a little bit on some of the numbers. Here's the NV DIMMs that you know, you, you've heard about, that they're various, I'm, these are all kind of approximate numbers. But the other things to think about is in a high stack hierarchy, we spend a lot of time optimizing on a layer. Optimizing for this layer, optimizing for this layer, for this layer. Things to think about is if you're looking at the capacities, especially when the CPU, the vendors own this. It's a fixed kilobyte, megabytes, and there's really not that much you can do to change that. The same in the number of DIMM sites. There's only a certain amount of DIMM sites on a fixed configuration you can get next to the device. So you, while you can get, you know, four and a half terabytes, you know, of capacity, you know, using 256, you know, gig DIMMs or, or, or 3 cross point at 512, you still are, there's, there's only so much you can get close to here. When you get down to the NVMe, and I broke NVMD in my own mindset to be a five drive right per day, which is a certain amount of over provisioning, and we'll talk a, a little bit about that in a minute. And so I've got performance and capacities. Performance ones are more focused on more over provisioning, better IOPS, better write IOPS, the other bottom one, the capacity ones, I'm focused on lower dollar per gigabyte at the expense of read performance. And you look at these, when you drop to this layer, you really don't have a limit that's hard set because you can fan it out on a bus infrastructure or PCI or put it on this side of InfiniBand where you can actually get really large volumes of data against that compute power so you, you have a degree of freedom that you didn't have before. So when you start the designing these things, especially when I start working with these things, I draw this line here and I start not worrying as much about latency, but more so about IOPS. And if you look at the summary from the previous chart, and again, I apologize about the X's there, is you can see what's happening is the whole infrastructure all the way down, and if you jump around these guys, you see they're all reads to writes is one to one. So your whole mindset is reads and writes, you can design that, you don't think in your head that I can't write the device. We are now looking at devices and some of the variations we're looking at 12 to 1 and these are only TLC. If you look at the QLC devices, the 4-bit per cell, it's way worse than 12 to 1 ratio. So you start to think about how do I use a device with this capacity when I can't write it? And writing has two parts. Not only is it putting data on there, is when a device recovers and you have to rebuild it because you want to recover data when you're running on the fly, you can't write it fast enough. So you have to worry about how long you are down in a degraded mode as well. So I'm going to start with some of the eye charts, and this is just one of a couple 3Ds. So this is how we designed things in the past. We had normalized the performance to the best performance, reads or writes. This is 100% reads, 100% writes, and this is percent 
access of capacity access, in other words, seek distance. This is a hard drive. So this is what we did in the past. A lot of systems are designed for this. What did you do when you had this chart? You tried to be, you wanted to be here in the back corner because you can see 0.65 to 0.91. You wanted to short stroke your drive because you wanted to run on this curve in the back. You didn't want to be at this lower corner because that was much worse performance. And that was a hard drive. As a side, why don't I use hard drives? Pain. And it, that sounds like old Mr. T here, right? If you look at, in this workspace, where you do not want a resource unutilized, and you hammer the living daylights out of it, you take the manufacturer's spec, you hammer it, you, and this is about 3 million hours, you're down under, under 300,000 hours when you start to beat it up. You take a number of drives and you put 10,000 on a system at 300,000 hours per drive, it's very hard to keep that system up. You are not only running rebuilds all the time, you are in severe probability of having data loss from multiple drive failures. So in the model that I am looking at, where you do not leave resources unutilized, you just can't survive with this curve. Okay. So here's the hard one. Here's the one that's a little even longer. This is measured, and we'll talk about it a little bit, and this was just measured a, a week or so ago, of a state-of-the-art NVMe device from a vendor and normalized ratio. So here's performance, right? So the highest performance is at, you know, at this top edge. Here is 100% read, so you can see 100% read. And in fact, you can also see, and this is the over-provisioning. This is where you have very little over-provisioning, biggest drive, a lot of over-provisioning, 140%, the, the smallest drive. Uh, excuse me, um, this, is the, this is the smallest drive, right. And as you re decrease the over-provisioning, over you can see you're going from about 1 to about 2.2 2, 2 of the performance. So you're falling off the edge. So now, when you do these, so, this, so the thing, this thing is going forward, this is a current drive. When you go forward, this edge down here is dipping even lower. So what you do not want to be doing if you want to, because as you increase the number of writes, you're stranding a resource. What resource are you stranding? The interface. So you've got a device capable of, you know, two, three gigabytes per second, you start doing some writes and that whole interface and all the infrastructure to support the drives stalls because you're stuck down here in the performance point. So let's take another way to look at this chart here. Um, here's a flip to 2D and you can take a look at it and here's what you can see. Here's the performance rates going in, highest performance, this 100% read up here. 100% write for different drive writes per day or actually different amount of over provisioning. So the ratio of how much over provisioning the drive writes per day, how many times you can write the drive before you do wear out is a vendor specific number. So I, I got to be careful here. So some vendors that number, that this is one vendor's numbers, right? So if you're down here and you have very little over provisioning, you can see you get a significant degradation in terms of performance. And as you start to increase the over provisioning, you can see the performance curve is coming up. But you also should see that the distance between them, especially as you start for this device, as you start to get larger, you get very little gain for additional over provisioning. So you, you want to stop. Now, this, the people in the room are going to go, who've looked at this, go, Keith, what's the heck with this bump here? All right? Now, what that is, that's a, me being impatient. Um, so when you measure the, the, remember, these devices are all intellectual properties and firmware, and the, the flash is the flash. Yeah, there's a difference in quality of the flash, but a lot of it's firmware. So these are all preconditioned drives. I, we ran the, we ran the bench, we would precondition the drives, which means you write all the blocks. You I mean, you'd, you sit the OP level, you run the precondition, 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 precondition for a certain period of time, and then you run a benchmark run. What I didn't include is the fact, is the charts that I did when I did that. When I did just that, all these numbers were lower. And I, we came back from lunch and we reran the last, so we, were, we worked from one drive right to day up to 
140% or from 7% OP to 140% OP. Came back, ran the second one once, and the whole curve moved up. What was happening is we were not giving the time for the change, the overprovisioning, where we increased the amount for the firmware and the drive to catch up. So one of the early problems with, with SSDs, especially when you're using big systems where you've got, you know, 2,000 of them, is that the firmware was written in ways where it would have trigger events like high water, lo low water marks. It would be running a while and make a trigger and then go do something, which is absolutely the worst possible thing to do for a parallel system. You throw a bump, you get one drive off, you know, doing recovery, you know, going through and do wear leveling on its flash, and the whole performance of the system dies. So what they've done is the side effect of that, they defer it all. So if you take, so as long as you've got workload, they're just backing off, not doing anything. But the fact that we went to lunch and, and, and went idle, the, 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 all the, the, the device went into this mode where it was going, running all the way through and normalizing. So what we did, we re-ran it. We ran the stuff, we, 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 we hammered on all the, the sectors to condition them, and we let it sit and let it come down. Obviously, for, for periods of time, I couldn't, to meet the schedule here, I couldn't wait for more because it takes like three days to run this stuff. And um, there's still a little bit of dip, but it's, this is close enough. Now, next thing. If you look at this thing, so if you look at the, the, the cost, so as you're running from 140% OP to, to 7%, you're looking at a 6 terabyte drive to 15 terabyte drive, obviously dollar per, as you're designing with these things, dollars per gigabyte goes, you know, goes down as you reduce over provisioning. But then let's take a look at the cost for the IOPS. Reads are flat. Reads don't even matter. You don't even have to worry about reads. Look what it does with writes. As the same bottom curve, as you start to reduce the over provisioning, the cost of the writes rockets, right? And it goes up at this exponential curve. The next generation is even worse. So when you're doing trade-offs here, it's very, you have two, two trains of thought. Look at your workload, try and find a compromise optimum point for a workload, hope, but I've never seen a workload be you know, completely uniform, where you're trading off cost for the capacity versus how much IOPS you need against that capacity to meet the workload requirements for the customer. It gets really hard to do. So what you end up doing in these kinds of models is you say, huh, I can't do one design point. So you split the difference in a way. You say, I'm going to have a small amount of storage, if I can possibly do it, down here because this costs so much per gigabyte because I'm way up here, but I only have a small amount. Is there a working, does the working set models have any validity where I can have a, you know, fast write storage in the, in the, and then have bulk reads? So back in, Oh, what is this, 2002? Two, two. This is when the slide was done. Probably we started before, and we did a study looking at the number of cylinders in, the, in the, this in the Teradata database. So actually, we were touched, and you could see, if you look at it here, you can see about 70% of all the IOs come from about 10% of the, of the data. Now, this was a static thing. This was done on hard drives. So you have to be careful. This was looking at database, but there's other things to be considered. But it gave us the idea, this was the, the motivation of saying, maybe we can do tier splitting. So we first started doing tiers, you know, creating a write tier and a read tier where you would get a really exp short stroke the heck out of the drive, use little drive, short stroke them, and use big fat drives for the bulk of the storage because you weren't hitting there. Easier said than done. But if you flip forward today, here's what, and, I, and again, this is one way to show this. I'm trying to be uh, space efficient here. If you take a 24 drive tray, you can split it in half. You go half of the drives with these big fat drives at 7% at over provisioning. And you can see if you have, 50, these are 15 terabyte drives, and you do, eight, you do a RAID 8 plus 2 distributed across here, across, 10 drive, across all 12 drives. You have about 145 terabytes of protected storage here. And you do this other half, you do with RAID 1, and you end up with one point, you usually like use a smaller drive at 1.6, you get about 9.6 terabytes, so you use a bigger drive. But you're doing a, a ratio, you're coming up with a right performant half with at a low, but a low capacity, keep the cost down, and then for the bulk stuff, trying to go to that previous curve that we showed about saying we did this initial study, put the cost here. Now, there's trade-offs to doing this. The capacity tier 
it's the right performance on RAID is, gets pretty ugly when you're not aligned to the stripe. So in other words, if, you, if you're right, don't go over the stripe. If it straddles between this stripe and, say, the next stripe, so you're using part of this one to part of this one, you end up with not you end up a lot of read modified write cycles, so you end up doing a lot of reads to do your writes, and you can get in trouble. So there's a lot of restrictions that file systems can't handle there. So you, but it especially gets worse is when you start to lose a drive in here, because you, to recover, you have to do some reads to recover the missing the drive to do the writes. In a RAID 1 format, you lose a drive. It doesn't impact the write performance at all. You just have to do the rebuilds. So the write tier with RAID 1, is great because e even when the loss of a drive, you don't see a drop on the right, and that's what you're trying to send there is multiple writes. On this side, you're trying to do reads, and your read performance is relatively good. So let's take a look. So if you look at the back end, look at the cost, and this is you can see the drive costs underneath. So this is the um, this is the the write performance here, or the hyper uh, the the write write optimized here. You can see that you're getting a ratio of between one and 0.5. So the read the the 100% reads 100% writes. You only get about a half the bandwidth. This is what you kind of expect for a RAID one. In the in the capacity tier, you're going to one to 1.2. It could have been better, but the IOs to that we see from the file systems aren't aligned all the time. So you end up that the drives are actually a little bit better. It should have been up a little bit higher for, this, for these numbers, but the fact that we were doing a lot of read modified write cycles, it, you kind of got this. So this is the picture. So here's an eye chart for you. So this is a trace from a real system running in the field. Um, the way to look at this, this is time. These are 10 minute buckets. So each of these is the summary of the IOs over 10 minutes. The blues are the reads, the orange are the writes. This is the right tier. This is the read tier. So you step back and you go, hmm, look at this. We're doing pretty good. You get a pretty good balance on the writes. You can see there's periods of very heavy writes. You can see there's some mismatch in reads. Somebody's off reading some stuff, writing spool and other kinds of things over here. So you get some of the writes. You can see this area here is actually quite interesting. This shows the working set spilled out, so it couldn't be maintained in the right tier, so it was spilling over into the read tier and is doing some replacements, so things are getting moved back. So these tiers are non-inclusive. This is not a cache. Blocks are either in files or in one or the other, so it's not an inclusive cache structure. So this is a pretty interesting thing, but if you look at it, there's still a lot of air. And a lot of the air is from the fact is, is that when you're working in one tier, the other tier is busy, and you see these gaps between one side, it's, it's kind of lopsided, and you go back and forth, and you see there's air here, but it doesn't correspond to busy here. So you know there's some inefficiencies here. If you really want to do this, you want to look at it, how can I get this white out of here? And then you come down here, and you go, what the hell happened here? Well, drive failed. When the drive failed, and you have a highly optimized system, and this is still relatively good. You got, you got some good balance. Remember, the scale is the same. Each, this, is a, this is measured at the server, at the bottom, going out to the arrays. So you were pulling, uh, oh, about six gigabytes out of the server, you know, doing, a, doing these kind of loads and probably with reads and writes. This thing's capable of probably around 12 or 13 gigabytes per server running, running the database. When you have a highly balanced here and you lose one feature, we, lo we lost a drive here, the workload dropped because it was going to the read tier, couldn't get there, so everything dropped off and the CPU busy idle just skyrocketed because you can't get to the drive and the drive went into this mode where it's constantly doing a recovery mechanism. So if you go back and sit there as this on a side, one of the lessons we, uh, you learn from these kinds of stuff is, why the heck was the loss of one drive so ugly? You know, it shouldn't have been. So these are actually real measured numbers, not normalized, because these ones are safe to use. Um, this is a little bit better than the, than the one drive, right? This is something like 28% uh, over provisioning. This is a little bit better drive. I didn't have um, the, the, uh, the, the, the one drive per day drive available. Um, this is 12. This is 12 drive pool, three drive write per day, eight plus two raid stripe or ten drives with two, two spares, so you can do rotated parity. 
Stripe is 256K. The IO size is 256K, so I'm trying to optimize it. I'm trying to get the best case you can get out of an array that's configured that way. So when you look at this, you go, this is the normal case, 100% read, 100% write, 100% random read. IO alignment. Is it aligned to the edge of the, of the, of the, of the uh, stripe? If it is aligned, you get pretty good performance on write and pretty good performance on reads. You can look at this, and these are random 256K writes are all over the place. If the alignment falls off on the writes, or it's not, the file system's not careful, you will realign to 4K, you notice the drop in performance. What was interesting is notice the fact that you have, you're doing 100% writes from the host, but if you look at the back end, there's 33% of the IOs are reads because it has to look at a different sector and do read modify writes because when you do a full stripe write, you just write the whole stripe. When you write part of a stripe, you got to read up blocks, modify parity P and Q, then write it back out. So you get this inefficiency, and if you're looking at it in terms of how much you ask from the host and what's going on the back end, you're only 44% efficiency. And of course, if you actually go to stripe writes, you're actually 76, and notice there's no reads. And of course, this shows you what you can do with reads. Let's take a look at what happens when you have a drive down. When you have a drive down, you see the efficiency, if you do nothing, goes from 44 to 27. And you can see the pretty dramatic drop. Now, these are better drives than was in that trace. So in the trace, and with those drives, this would have been well under a gigabyte, right? Uh, and so you can see where the performance was that wasn't aligned. However, if you had aligned it, you would have been looking at a drop from 74 to 71, which would have been barely measurable. So this is a case that if you engineer in how you use the storage subsystem and knowing the fact that you were going to be running with degraded mode and design that in there, both the software and the hardware cooperate, you can mitigate off the loss of performance. So you're looking at 74 to 71, which is not very significant versus the fact you went from 51 to 33 or 31, or in the case of the one drive write per day, you went down to a gigabyte. It's not, you have to be, it's a very effective way to do that. And of course, you can see the efficiency. Now there's some funny things in here. You go, why did the efficiency get better you know, because on random write from here to here, well, it's doing one less write because there's a missing drive. So you're doing full stripe writes, but it's doing one less write, so you're actually getting a little bit better efficiency, but the number of stuff moves. So this, so this is an interesting lesson. It's an aside, but it's one approach to trying dealing with the fact that you have to be aware of drive failures. Now, let's talk about what do you do going forward. The goal is to get the utilization up, and remember I said much of the utilization is when you start to do writes to flash, you can't do, re the read performance drops off radically, or the whole throughput drops off. And that's because you're, you're taking the entire device and you're bringing it down. And basically you're moving, if you're using an entire device, all those flash devices are doing that same percentage of reads and writes. So this interface here, right here, this interface st it starts to be underutilized. Now, there was a study done by um, Facebook and Intel. It was in the Flash Memory Summit in 2017, where they looked at the case of a noisy neighbor. And in their mo model, they had multiple users that going to a flash storage device, just like this. We know we, we look going forward, if you have a multi-tenancy like this, and one tenant or one user starts to do lots of writes what, and everybody's sharing this flash. What happens? You move down the curve, even if he's one quarter, you move significantly down the curve so those other threads get heavily impacted. The moment you, one of them starts to do writes and the others are doing reads, they all feel it. So in this case for multi-tenancy, they said, this is not usable. We're trying to sell a service to multiple tenants. We want to reuse the devices, but the, the interference or the noisy neighbor problem is so severe, especially when you start to do writes. So what they did is they started, they made a proposal that for the NVMe 1.4, and it's called uh, sets and groups. Now, let's talk a little bit about what a set is. 
A set is you'll, you can partition up the con parts of the drive into pieces. Now, I did a, a fairly simple model, but you can break off chains. So if, if you, let's take a look at this. This is a core which manages all these flash devices. So there's four, memory, there's four flash channels off the back of this, and then these are cascaded on them. So each of these have a bandwidth contribution. So in one case, is if you can, I, say you did an isolation, you broke this into four pieces. This group would operate and be assigned to one user. This would be the second one. This would be the third one and the fourth one. So you basically partition the drive into, or using what's called NVMe sets, into four pieces where they each operate independently. On top of that, they have this concept of endurance groups. And in this, for the case of this things, I made endurance groups and, and sets the same thing. So you can have endurance groups go across two sets, but let's just keep it simple. That's saying that where leveling, reads and writes on this set stay within this piece of hardware for each device. So then you get isolation. If this guy does lots of writes and he's doing lots of reads, he sees those impacts. Second, since we know that the sum of the bandwidths on reads out of these devices is greater than NVMe, take a look what happens. If I start to go down that, right cur that performance curve because I'm doing writes, this guy's, if he had a one quarter of the interface, he's going to be using significantly less of that interface because he's doing writes, freeing up that interface for other people to get increased read performance. So now you're looking at the fact is you're making a finer grain allocation, which means you can start to balance and get that interface up higher because you can start to mix and match. The other thing to think about, and it's kind of in the spec, and I haven't validated it yet. I've been modeling this thing, but I have no physical devices yet is if there's a failure in flash, and the, one of the most common failures in flash devices is there you lose, you lose a chip or a plane within the chip. And the normal model for a lot of the arrays and, and storage structures, when you lose one, you, the whole drive goes into failure mode. And there's some motivations to try and fail out LBAs. But you end up a failure here impacts the whole device. When you have a set. The hope is, and I'm trying to get this validated when I get one in my hands, is that the failure remains within the set. So now I've reduced my exposure. I have a failure that would have been all the, 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 all the devices and the entire device being failed four times the capacity in this case and four times the bandwidth. I'm exposing only a quarter of the capacity of flash and only a quarter of the performance of the flash to a failure mode. Okay, so this is a significant hope for using tiering. So now, is, is isolating performance. So how do you do this with tiering? So let's just do a little bit of tier example. So again, two tiers, write optimized tier and a read optimized tier. We can break these into sets, and we're doing trade-offs and how much over-provisioning you want to do. You can vary the over-provisioning in this set to be different from that. So you can make a read-intensive and a write-intensive device. You can split it all up. And you can divide the resources up. So if you actually take a look at it and you build an array with this thing, you end up with something like this. So instead of having 24 drives, I have 48 of performance, and I got 48 of Capacity drives, because I broke them each, each into fours. So if you look at it, so you, if you look at the layout then, if you look at a single drive, it actually got, in this case, I used two of the NVMe sets for, for RAID 1. So I have two different sets of RAID 1s. And I used two different sets for read intensive and broke it down that way. So now if I get a failure in a set, I'm only taking out one quarter and not, and, or half the read intensive, but I'm not taking out the entire part. It also means that imbalances, if I'm doing writes on this side and I'm doing reads on this side, the bandwidth that I'm not using for reads on this side can be used for that side. So the hope is, in the mo and I've been modeling it, the models work, but I, like anything else, especially with, with NVMe devices, I'm not going to say anything until I see one in my hands and do they perform the way I they think the spec is. But the hope is by doing this, we can start to at least 
hide off some of the impact of having this read to write disparity that we see in the drives. And I think we're done. <laughs>